yeah, as I said, a paper on the price of healthy and unhealthy foods in almost the whole world, not all. Um, and it's a kind of sub-project, part of a broader project um, funded by Bill and Melinda and uh, or managed by Shelley uh, Sundberg, who I think is here. And we're, this is a paper I'm going to give you a snapshot of food prices, going to make cross-sectional comparisons across countries, but we've got other papers coming that are going to look at trends over time. And this paper is co-authored uh, with Harold Alderman, uh, Chandra Maitra, and Prasada Rao uh, from University of Queensland. So this is kind of an unnecessary slide for this audience. Diets are important, basically, all, all, is, all, is all it says. This is from the 2015 Global Burden of Disease study that says that dietary risks are the single largest uh, non-metabolic -metab uh, risk factor in the global burden of disease, 20% um, of all dailies. Malnutrition is kind of weirdly defined in this. It's mostly non-diet, but you, know, you could add some of that in. And basically, poor diets are a really big um, global health problem. But these dietary problems vary across regions and income groups. Um, in low-income countries, obviously, protein energy undernutrition is there, multiple micronutrient deficiencies, lack of high-quality protein, particularly animal source foods. In high-income countries, excess intake of carbs, sugars, trans fats, processed red meat, and still low intake of uh, fruits and vegetables and whole grains. And then middle-income countries you know, increasingly have both problems, as do many low-income countries now. So you're seeing overnutrition, undernutrition, um, in these countries occurring simultaneously. So the question we're kind of trying to get at here is, are overnutrition and undernutrition problems connected by the affordability of healthy and unhealthy foods? And I'll define affordability in a minute. So most work on food prices and nutrition has actually focused on high-income countries, which is kind of weird. Um, but there's, a, for example, a guy called Drunowski um, who's looked at this issue in the obesity literature and actually found that higher prices of healthy foods explain obesity in places like Seattle um, and other high-income countries. So it's sort of strange that we haven't seen much on that yet in um, low-income countries, although we saw quite a bit of talk of um, prices in the EANDA study this morning and, and other studies. There are only two studies that do comparative analysis across countries that I found. One is by uh, ODI, by Steve Wiggins, who looks at price trends in three middle-income countries and three upper-income countries, so no developing countries. And he shows that the prices of fruits and vegetables have gone up more than um, unhealthy foods. Um, and then there's this pure study that looked at fruit and vegetables, um, but it only looked at affordability relative, relative to income, not at prices. In low-income countries and middle-income countries, there are a few contributions looking at this issue. You have demand analysis, so economists do tons of demand analysis and they have own price elasticities, but they don't really have a nutritional motivation. The biofortification literature, Howdy Bowie has for many years said, the reason we need to bio biofortify um, uh, staple foods is because micronutrient-rich foods like fruits and vegetables are very expensive and often increasing. Um, but so a lot of this work actually introspectively is, is motivated by seeing Howdy's presentations over the years, but he's really only presented data for Bangladesh and India, um, and this is a kind of attempt to look more systematically at, at many countries. And then there's a recent kind of ag nutrition literature, um, mostly on India and Bangladesh, that's looked at this. So actually my first study in nutrition, we, we looked at price trends in India. Some uh, IFPRI colleagues looked at this in Bangladesh, and as, as uh, we saw from Anna this morning, there's work from Eander as well. So what I do in this paper is use prices for standardized foods in 177 countries. So these I'll explain this in a minute. And we basically argue from a kind of theoretical point of view that calorie content is a very important factor in um, motivating food decisions. As I said, in rich countries they found that calorie content matters, but in poor countries, you, know, you can imagine someone facing famine conditions, they're just going to eat the cheapest source of calories there are. When their income goes up, they'll start diversifying and buying more expensive calories. Um, the reason we focus, uh, we also focus on cereals as the kind of numeraire here because in most countries cereals are the main source of calories, not all but most. And so what we construct are what we call calorie price ratios. So that's basically the cost of one egg calorie to one cereal calorie. So how much does it cost to get a, a calorie from egg relative to the cheapest cereal in that country? So it could be rice for example. So this captures the cost of diversifying out of staples at a given level of income. And our hypotheses, well, first is kind of what economists call the law of one price, and like most economic laws, it, nobody thinks it holds, but we call it a law for some reason. Um, and that basically says that if there's no transaction costs, which is why it doesn't hold, um, there'll be really no price variation um, across countries. So it wouldn't matter if you were living in Nepal or the US, the price of milk relative to cereals would, would be the same. The alternative is that food prices vary a lot across countries. 
um, although we'd suspect they vary more for foods that can't be traded across countries like eggs or even can't be traded much within countries. So more true for perishable fruits and vegetables and animal source foods. And then a second hypothesis I'm not going to show here is that non-tradable food prices should be influenced by local productivity. So if your country is not very good at producing eggs, eggs are going to be expensive in your country. And then a further hypothesis is that variation in food prices actually explains child feeding patterns and maybe stunting uh, too. So methods, we use this, uh, what's called International Comparison Program data. If you've ever used GDP data that's in purchasing power parity units, it's based on the ICP. So the whole idea is to measure, make welfare comparisons across countries. So the, uh, at the heart of that is the cost of living, um, so purchasing power. And to do that, you need to obviously measure prices, but you need to do it for products that are kind of defined the same way across countries. So they're what they call standard definition products. And what we have is incomplete data on 200 food products. In the whole ICP, there's about 2,000 goods and services, but there's 200 food products. Um, so there's gaps, but yeah, we have those uh, food product prices for 177 countries. These are national average prices. They're means taken across a bunch of different vendors. So in a country like Nepal, they do street markets or bazaars, as well as you know, a few supermarkets, etc. And they're supposed to be nationally representative. There's a few gaps that we fill in with national sources. Um, I won't go into that now. And then we combine that with USDA food conversion data to look at the calorie content of these um, standardized food products. We then group it into uh, foods into 17 food groups, and we measure the cheapest food in each. So we're going to measure the cheapest green leafy vegetable, etc., relative to the cheapest cereal. So the strengths, high degrees of standardization in the ODI study I mentioned, foods were defined in different ways across countries, but this is highly standardized. Weaknesses, um, 200 food products around the world is actually not that much. You think about how many types of vegetables there are in South Asia, there's, you know, 500 or something. Um, so some of these categories are underpopulated. Um, most of the animal source foods are pretty well um, estimated and, and as is many other categories. So just to give you a definition, um, I'll read through this very quickly for rice. This is their standard definition. Long grain, white rice, milled rice, pre-packed, pl uh, paper or plastic bag, high grade, preparation, etc., etc. So they're very standardized and you'll find that for all the products. Um, these are the food groups. Um, just briefly, they've got two kind of starchy staples, um, six groups of healthy vegetable foods, uh, five groups of animal source foods, and then some unhealthy condiments and junk food. So we analyzed this data in several steps, but I think I'm actually going to skip through this and just get, go to the um, results and we can ask questions later. So these are population weighted measures of the prices relative to the cheapest cereals in low income countries, middle income countries and high income countries. So you can see there's a lot of variation across levels of development. The next graph is just going to show you the ratio relative to high income countries. So the main message here, just to take an example, eggs and poultry are five times more expensive in low-income countries um, than they are in high-income countries. And for people who've you know, lived in high-income countries, think about eggs, for example. You can buy a dozen eggs for $2.20 in the US, which is phenomenally cheap in a uh, historical perspective because a loaf of bread costs anywhere from 3 to $5. Uh, whereas in poor countries, eggs are really expensive um, relative to cereals. So in most cases, we see that um, food prices, healthy foods and some unhealthy foods, are more expensive in low and middle income countries. There's a few exceptions, like dark green leafy vegetables. It's not so strong because those are uh, expensive to produce. Skip this graph. That's just showing you variation across regions, but the same kind of story. And I'm going to focus here on five animal source foods and pulses. And really, from left to right, this is high income is the first one, and then to right you get through Central, a uh, Central America, um, South Asia, and then the the last ones are all um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So the story here is dairy in South Asia, for example, is a bit more expensive than high income countries, but dairy in Africa is um, very expensive in relative terms. Same, even stronger story for eggs, um, which are you know uh, vary a lot in productivity around the world. Um, so eggs, very expensive in most of Africa, also expensive in South Asia, though, though somewhat variable. Pulses, obviously cheaper, as you would expect, sometimes called the poor man's meat, um, but a bit expensive in Africa. Um, poultry meat, very similar story to um, eggs, um, you know, getting very expensive in Africa and to some extent in South Asia. Red meat, there's a bit of variability. And then fish, actually, this is something that surprised me, fish is actually relatively uh, cheap. So, does, do these prices matter? 
Um, so this is kind of quasi-demand estimation. Um, and this is taking child um, dietary diversity data from the DHS across countries and regressing it against prices. So we've got about kind of 50 to 60 countries. And the main story is that the prices of animal source foods tend to explain animal source food consumption. So dairy prices explain dairy consumption, egg prices explain egg consumption. A um, little bit weaker for fish and meat, but kind of, the, and there is a significant result also for other fruit. So it really seems to at least explain animal source food consumption across countries. We then looked at stunting, and same kind of story. Um, dairy prices and egg prices, you know, higher prices of dairy and eggs um, predict higher stunting rates, even controlling for GDP per capita. So conclusions, this is the first paper to measure food prices in a comparative, highly standardized uh, cross-country framework. The main findings, food prices are highly variable across countries and regions, but especially for those perishable foods. Um, most foods are relatively cheap in high-income countries compared to cereals, um, but there are some exceptions for fruits and vegetables. Unhealthy foods are expensive in low-income countries, but um, getting cheaper in middle-income countries. Animal source foods are much more expensive in low- and middle-income countries, especially um, eggs and meat. Dairy and egg prices explain child consumption and stunting. And then in policy implications, um, foods rich in protein and micronutrients are obviously very expensive in low-income countries and likely strongly correlated with productivity levels and agroecological constraints. And so high prices might also constrain behavioral interventions. And uh, research implications, I think we still don't know how to calorie relative food prices vary within countries. Um, we only look across countries. Um, and how to calorie relative food prices vary over time. How have these trends, uh, these relative prices changed over time? and what production value chain or trade interventions could most effectively reduce prices in different kinds of settings.